What's the scariest thing I've done as a surgeon? How much sleep do I get? And what are my favorite study tips? Keep watching. I recently put a call out on Instagram to see what questions you guys might want me to answer, and I got some great ones. So let's talk. What made you decide to become a surgeon? It was actually a surprise. I came into med school thinking that I was gonna be a pediatrician. Uh, I really liked the pediatrician that I had growing up. I liked volunteering in different organizations with kids when I was in college. And it was just what I expected I was gonna do in my medical career. But when I got to medical school and I started working on rotations, I really, really enjoyed working with my hands. There was this moment that I had when I was a medical student on my surgery rotation. I was uh, with my chief resident helping to suture a wound close and a resident from another team popped into the OR and was talking to him for a minute and looked down at me and made some comment and had assumed that I was a resident from another program visiting uh, because I, I guess I looked like I knew what I was doing. It felt like a really big deal and it made me feel like I was in a place where I belonged and like I had this kind of aptitude or skill that I could develop even more. What is the best part of being a surgeon? The things that I really love about being a surgeon are the kind of connections that you make with your patients. It's this trust that your patients put in you that's different from other areas of medicine. You're helping to heal someone with your own two hands when you do surgery. And it sounds cheesy, but it's just this incredible feeling. And I always say it's the best job in the world. How do surgeons keep their hands from shaking? This is actually a question that I've gotten a bunch over the years. If you hold your hand up and hold it as still as you can for like five seconds and look at it really carefully, we all have a small amount of tremor. It's not that we learn how to get rid of that, but we learn techniques and we develop a certain type of skill that naturally is allowing us to stabilize our hands while we're operating. For instance, our wrist might be resting against one thing so that our fingers can be even more still. How much sleep do you get on average? I've been asked this question over the years at different parts of my surgical career, and I always used to joke that I get anywhere from zero to 12 hours. <laughs> um, like in residency, if you had a 24 hour shift or longer, you might be up that entire time and then you might sort of binge on sleep immediately after. And certainly now that I'm an attending, it's pretty uncommon that I'll be up 24 hours without any sleep at all. The answer for right now is I get somewhere around seven hours plus minus of sleep most nights, which I think is really great. Do you ever get scared when you're operating? <laughs> Two words, audible bleeding. In surgery, it's not really a question of feeling scared in the operating room, as much as there are situations and circumstances where you might suddenly have a higher acuity and more urgency with what you're doing. When you're in a trauma surgery and the patient is bleeding so much that you can hear it, that's a serious situation. You might think that our next step is to fix the injury as quick as possible, to sew it shut or to find some way to get a quick fix. But the reality is that's actually a moment where we really slow down. So the first thing that you do as a surgeon is you hold pressure proximal to the source of bleeding, and then you start to communicate and really get your team together. So you talk to the anesthesiologist and let them know that when you let go of this again, the patient's suddenly gonna get hypotensive and you give them time to catch up on the volume and the fluid for resuscitation. You might talk to the OR nurse and ask her to get more blood in the room to be ready to transfuse. You know, we might talk to the resident and ask them to get a different retractor ready and to sort of prepare the exposure for the site. And you do all of these things while you're holding pressure so that the moment that you let go, you have everything ready to help you fix it as efficiently and safely as possible. What is your advice on how to choose a specialty? This is something that I think a lot of medical students deal with when they're on the rotations. And frankly, there may be more than one choice that makes you happy. So when I'm talking to med students about this, I have some rules of thumb that I think about. When you're on a team, see if you feel like you kind of jive with them. If you feel like the culture of that team is something that feels like home for you. Because if it is, that's a good sign. Other things that I think are helpful for people to think about are, are you someone that likes to do procedures or are you someone that likes to solve problems and be analytical, but don't really want to work with your hands that much. Advice on applying to medical school or residency or fellowship or XYZ. So here's my philosophy. You've got the basic stuff that everyone has to have. I call that the table stakes. And then you've got everything else. Uh, 
the fluff, or whatever you wanna call it. So the table stakes is really get the best grades that you are capable of getting and do as well as you can on standardized tests. Standardized tests have never been something that I felt comfortable with. I've always really had to struggle to do well. It's always taken a lot of work. I've never felt like it's something that's effortless, but I really had to learn how to perform well on these tests in order to be able to move ahead in my career. So once that's taken care of, once you are getting the best grades that you're capable of and the best scores that you yourself can get, then you can think about everything else. Yes, it's great to get some volunteering time in if you're applying to medical school. Yes, it's great to have some extracurricular activities that you can say in your application. But really what I would say is follow your own passion. Take time to pursue your passions and any medical school or any residency or fellowship that's worth your time will appreciate you for who you are and will appreciate that you have these interests that you still manage to pursue along the side. How old is Gershwin? So if you've been watching my videos recently, uh, you'll see that I have a new puppy. He's a mini golden doodle. His name's Gershwin and he is about six months old. I think you'll be seeing a lot more of him on the channel. How do you manage surgery and your YouTube channel? Okay, so I'm gonna give you a quick answer and then I'm gonna get a little bit more philosophical. The quick answer is I fit it in where I can. You've probably noticed that a lot of these videos recently have sort of looked a little bit like I have a darker background. And that's because it's nighttime right now. That's when I tend to have most of my free time. My philosophical answer is whatever you are interested in that's sort of outside of your professional track, you're never ever going to have enough time for it. So don't delay yourself by pursuing these other things. Don't say, look, once I get into med school, I can do this other stuff. Or once I get into the residency I want, I can start going after these hobbies because it's never going to happen. You're always gonna be busy. There's always gonna be something else that's sort of taking up your time. And so the way I've thought about YouTube and the way I always encourage people to think about their other passions outside of sort of their official thing is to realize that you'll never officially have time for it and that you have to make time and sort of shoehorn it into your life and carve out moments to pursue these things. So that's my advice. Thoughts on tourniquets for hemorrhage control? Uh, yes. So if you have an actual tourniquet and you are trained in how to properly use a tourniquet, then absolutely. If someone in front of you is having a life-threatening bleed, by all means, apply the tourniquet correctly. Now, if you're someone who's out and about in public and you don't have medical training and there's a situation where someone has an emergency and they have a life-threatening bleed, the best thing you can do is to apply direct pressure just above the area of the bleeding, or if you don't know where it's coming from, right on the area of bleeding until help comes. Unfortunately, having a basic working knowledge of how to stop bleeding is becoming more and more important for the general public just in the way that CPR is. With today's events and the violence that we're starting to see on a more regular basis, it's more and more important for the general public to understand these things. There's an incredible organization called Stop the Bleed. It is this like great nonprofit coalition that does trainings and education. Um, I'll have them linked up below. They're a great resource to go to. What are your favorite study tips? <laughs> the word favorite and studying isn't usually in the same sentence for me. Um, so I'll say this, a couple quick things. When I'm studying, and I think it's useful in general, I like to block out an amount of time and say, look, I'm gonna study for three hours between now and dinner time. And I also like to write down on a piece of paper, not on the computer, I don't like to type it out. I like to write down exactly what I want to do and what I wanna study. It helps me stay on track while I'm working, and as I make some progress, I can kind of tick it off, and it helps give me little boost of confidence. The second thing is I like to set the steam to be able to concentrate as well as possible. So I like to work in a quiet room or space and I use a software called Brain FM. Um, I'll have that linked up below. It's this really neat software that uses different types of these rhythmic beats to create sounds that are optimized either for relaxation or for focus or for sleep. Uh, they've got a bunch of research about how their stuff works on their website. I haven't read any of it. All I can say is that for me, I found it helpful uh, for several years now. And then my final tip about studying is kind of counterintuitive. It's to be nice to yourself. Like if you set a certain amount of goals or you have certain objectives that you want to accomplish when you're studying and you don't meet them, give yourself a break. Forgive yourself. Maybe spend a moment figuring out what went wrong and how you might do it differently next time and then move on. And if you've ever been curious about what surgery was like 150 years ago, I'm working on a new series right now and click right here to take a look. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you.